Good afternoon. Welcome to the second webinar of the Cooking for Success series, Recipes for Growing Food-Based Businesses. This webinar series is a partnership between the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders, NALCAB, and the Californian Association for Microenterprise Opportunity, CAMEO, and has been made possible with support from the Kellogg Foundation. This webinar is being recorded, and we will distribute the recording and slides to everyone who has registered. Also, attendees have been muted, but we encourage you to ask questions. So please type your questions in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. We will monitor them and ask them throughout the webinar as possible, and we'll have additional time for Q&A at the end. Leading the webinar today, we have myself, Storm Taliaferro from NALCAB, and Heidi Pickman from Cameo. A little bit about NALCAP. NALCAP strengthens the economy by advancing economic mobility in Latino communities. We are the hub of a national network of more than 120 organizations in 40 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico that are anchor institutions in geographically and ethnically diverse Latino communities. Um, thanks, Storm, and thanks to everybody who's joined. As many of you know, food entrepreneurship plays a vital role in creating economic mobility for Latino and other immigrant families and their communities as a whole. And I think it's safe to say that if you're here attending this webinar, um, then you care about the success of the entrepreneurs in your community. We've noticed that Cameo approaches to entrepreneurial support usually are presented in narrow silos. Either someone is a training organization or they care about training entrepreneurs or they care about access to capital. Um, and a lot of you may focus on one thing and that's okay, but I just want you to know and Cameo wants you to know and we want to increase awareness and work toward a more holistic view, um, what we call the local entrepreneurial ecosystem. And just to, for those of you who don't know who Cameo is, we're the statewide network of entrepreneurial training programs, micro lenders, and other business service providers um, that are in this ecosystem that I'll, that I'll explain in a second. Um, and we do activities like capacity building, webinars such as this, advocacy in Sacramento and D.C., and we play a convening role, much like NALCAB does for our members. Um, so. Um, some people may call um, the approach that we're trying to, that we're thinking about and trying to push forward as place-based economics. And at Cameo, as I mentioned, we call it the local entrepreneurial ecosystem. And it's made up of five C's, which you can see on this graphic. Um, it's coaching. So coaching is mentoring meetings, classes, one-on-ones, advising, um, all that kind of um, teaching, he, developing human capital. Um, capital is the second C, that's the money part, um, when um, that people need to, businesses need to grow. Um, and then there's connections, connections to markets and connections to other entrepreneurs. Um, and that happens in co-working spaces, incubators, but also connecting, uh, by connecting we need, mean connecting as in marketplaces, as in say online platforms or connecting to other regions um, so that you can have, um, you can export outside your, your community. Um, and then the fourth C is culture. Culture is how a community sees um, entrepreneurship. Um, is it a good, valid career path? Um, and then the fifth C is climate, is the regulatory process. Um, and when these pieces are all in place, small businesses can succeed they create jobs, they create financial health and wealth for families, and local communities succeed as well. Um, all the pieces need to be in place and they all interact with each other. And this webinar series is about the local entrepreneurial ecosystem as it refers to the food industry. So we just decided for the sake of time to narrow it down to three, three parts and not go through all of the five C's, but 
I'm gonna, I'll remind everybody, they do all work together and all the pieces need to be in place. And if anybody wants to know more, I'm more than happy to discuss um, the other pieces. Um, last month we talked about coaching. Next month we'll talk about climate and the policy. And today we're looking at the capital piece. So we hope this series, and pardon our pun, but we couldn't help it. We had a lot of fun here. We, it, we hope the series is food for thought on how to support emerging entrepreneurs and transform the entrepreneurial environment for Latino and immigrant families engaged in neighborhood-based small business activity. And our ultimate goal is to ensure our food entrepreneurs are successful and our communities are sustainable. Um, with that in mind, I'll kick it back to Storm. Thank you, Heidi. All right, so we'll walk through our agenda quickly. We'll do uh, introductions and uh, sort of an audience poll where you type into the response into your chat box. Um, we'll look at some numbers around capital for uh, small businesses. Um, and then we will have our uh, expert guests from California FarmLink and Latino Economic Development Corporation uh, to speak on rural and urban small business lending, followed by a question and answer session, and we'll close with additional resources. So uh, we'd like to quick off, uh, kick off quickly by seeing uh, who is in the room. Um, Let's see, we'd like to know, how are you supporting entrepreneurs? Uh, if you can type in, if you're uh, doing coaching and technical assistance, training or classes, capital assistance, um, such as loans or equity or grant assistance, some sort of real estate related assistance where you have an, an incubator or rental space, um, policy advocacy, um, or financial capability assistance. Um, also, if you're a food entrepreneur, we've had some on the uh, previous call, um, please type that in. Or if you um, support small businesses in some other way, uh, please go ahead and type that into the chat field now. Great, so we're getting some responses. Um, we have a new SVCD on the line. Um, also, a CDFI offers access to capital, um, a number of groups that offer one-on-one -on -one counseling and training programs, um, groups that offer both loans and coaching, um, coaching and technical assistance. So um, a lot of uh, variety of different organizations here on the line. Okay, great. And um, a number of groups uh, with whom we're pretty familiar. Great. And one other question. Um, in terms of your organization's experience with lending, if you could let us know if you're not currently lending or in the process of implementing lending, uh, less than three years, three to five years, um, more than five years, or if uh, what you do is refer to lending partners. We'd like to, uh, to know sort of how deep the, the knowledge and experience is in lending with the folks uh, in our virtual room here. Great. So looking at those responses, again, we have a pretty wide range, several who are not currently lending, several who refer to lending partners, um, and many who have been lending for, for more than five years. Um, I would say lots of, lots of referrals here in this group. Okay, great. Well, we do appreciate all of your attendance here and your, um, your interest and focus on this important topic um, will into which we will dive right into right now, um, which is growing your client's food business. So um, let's see, next slide, slide please. Uh, for growth, businesses need capital. Access to crap capital is often critical to a food entrepreneur's ability to meet operating expenses, expand and grow, and succeed. So to set the stage here, let's take a quick look at small business credit. The 2019 Federal Reserve Small Business Credit Survey reports for employer businesses, which are small businesses with paid employees in that middle, middle column there, and non-employer businesses. Those are small businesses that have no paid employees. Those are the smallest of the small. So these numbers 
numbers show that as they headed into 2018, 43% of the employer firms applied for new financing versus only 26% for non-employer firms. Then we see these numbers almost inverted, right? When it comes to unmet funding needs, 43% uh, of non-employer firms had unmet funding needs, whereas 29% of employer firms had unmet funding needs. Now, if you look at those unmet funding needs through the lenses of race and, race and ethnicity, 39% of those firms were non-Hispanic white owned, 60% were non-Hispanic black owned, and 54% were Hispanic. Now, overall, non-employer firms were more likely to be debt averse or discouraged from applying for loans and twice as likely to have debt that is uh, unsecured by collateral, such as credit cards, which we all know have relatively unfavorable terms. Other interesting info towards the bottom there, 32% applied to online lenders, which for the record was an increase of 8% over the previous year. And this is despite online lenders generally less favorable terms, yet faster response times and, and higher approval rates and perhaps perceived anonymity um, are still attractive to the borrowers. The 2019 Federal Reserve Bank Small Business Credit Survey Report on Minority-Owned Firms, uh, this data shows that of these uh, online lending applicants, 32% of the firms were white-owned, 41% black-owned, and 53% Hispanic-owned. So in the light of this lack of access to credit to small businesses, including food entrepreneurs, we are so happy to have our guest speakers here today to talk about how they are working to help entrepreneurs access funding in their communities. So today we have Mario Graciano from California FarmLink and Emmy Reyes from Latino Economic Development Center. Mario will speak about supporting food-based businesses and entrepreneurs in rural agricultural areas of California, and Emmy Reyes will discuss connecting food-based clients to capital in the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland metropolitan areas. Right now, I'll turn it over to Mario. Mario, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Storm, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this um, webinar. I'll wait for the next slide. Uh, well, hello everyone. Again, my name is Mario Graciano. I am the Lending and Loan Service Associate here at California FarmLink. Um, I've been with FarmLink for a little bit over a year now. Before joining FarmLink, I worked for a uh, bank for almost eight years. Um, so I am a recovering banker, as they like to call it here. Um, before I decided to go back to school, um, I would eventually hear about FarmLink um, and what they do through school. Um, my role here involves helping clients gather the necessary paperwork to apply for a loan. Um, along with seeing if the inquiry is a good candidate for our loan program. Uh, this is typically done by an online inquiry where we receive uh, the information from the client through our website, um, a phone call, or an in-person meeting. Uh, once we've gathered the necessary materials and see that the client is ready to submit an application, it then gets transferred to a loan officer who then underwrites and types up a memo to present to our loan committee um, for a decision. Uh, next slide, please. So what is FarmLink? Uh, FarmLink is a statewide nonprofit ag lender that started in 1999 as a land linking organization and it's located in Aptos, California. Uh, FarmLink started doing direct loans, however, until 2011 and was later certified as a community development financial institution in 2013, also known as a CDFI. Um, FarmLink collaborates with local and statewide governmental agencies, um, impact investors, uh, nonprofits, training programs, and training programs to help farmers uh, access the land and capital throughout the state of uh, California. Next slide. As seen on this slide, um, our mission is to link independent farmers and ranchers with the land, financing, and information they need for a sustainable future. Next slide. So what is our special sauce? Uh, FarmLink provides technical assistance to farmers by offering assistance with uh, succession planning, finding land, and reviewing as well as securing and negotiating strong leases. 
Uh, we also offer loans that include annual operating loans, land loans, equipment and infrastructure loans, as well as conservation loans. Um, loan amounts range from uh, 2500 to 500000 for operating loans and up to $1.75 million for land loans. Um, our average loan size um, of loans that we have deployed is $40,000. Uh, interest rates range between uh, 78 per 7 to 8% for operating and equipment loans and 5 to 7% for land loans. Uh, we do have application fees of 2% of whatever the loan amount is for all loans with the exception of land loans. Uh, land loan application fees range anywhere between 1% to 2% depending on the loan amount. And in most cases, uh, these loans require a guarantee from the Farm Service Agency, which is a branch from the USDA, um, uh, which is a 1.5% on top of the application fee. Next slide. So now my favorite slide of the, of the presentation here uh, is our success story. Uh, here we see Berta Magaña. Mrs. Magaña started Magaña Farms in 2011 when she decided to start her own business um, after working for agriculture or other agriculture companies uh, for more than 30 years. Uh, Mrs. Magaña att attended ALBA, a Salinas, California nonprofit farm incubator that provides education and training on organic farming. Uh, Mrs. Magaña has borrowed from us on uh, four different occasions. In 2011, she received her first operating loan of $10,000. Uh, in 2012, she successfully, uh, I'm sorry, in 2011, she received another $25,000 um, loan, which she also successfully repaid. Uh, and in the following year, she received a $60,000 uh, loan that was also um, successfully repaid, for which she only actually used $45,000. Um, after a few years of successful repayment on uh, prior loans combined with an opportunity to purchase land, Mrs. Bagania applied and was approved for a $250,000 land loan in 2016 to purchase a 10-acre property in Watsonville, California. Uh, finally, it is important to know that the land she acquired is a property that she received lease assistance from farming staff for which it included a, a first right of refusal. Thank you. Next slide. And with that, I just want to see if there's any um, clarifying questions or any information that I uh, presented today. Yeah. Hey, Mario, this is Heidi. Can you go back to, let's talk more about Mrs. Magana. And sure. uh, can you t talk, you said something at the end. I didn't quite catch that um, mm -hmm. about her journey. Um, she, she, she did something with Farmly. I Can you repeat what yes. she did? And then sure. I had a question yes. about it. Exactly. So um, like I mentioned in, uh, you know, the special sauce um, slide, um, or what we do, um, you know, part of the, of the things that we do is to provide technical assistance um, to farmers by offering assistance with, um, you know, re reviewing uh, leases or negotiating lease agreements. Um, so, uh, Breza Magana came to us uh, via uh, loan uh, need as well as lease help. Um, so, she started with the operating loan of 10000 as well as a, a need for um, lease assistance. So, um, like what I said at the end was that um, she received lease uh, assistance uh, that included a first right re a refusal that eventually later turned into a, um, a land loan um, with us. Oh, so she bu she bought the property. So you that guys, she you she leased it first, and then the, exactly. and then she was able to b buy the property with your help. Okay. Exactly. Oh, got it. And do you happen to know how many employees she um, employs? I don't. I don't. Okay. Um, I can get that information for you. Yeah. 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 Great. Great. Um, and about how many clients does um, California Capital? Sorry, California FarmLink serve? We've deployed um, as of December uh, of last year uh, three, a little bit over 330 loans. Out of those 330 loans. Uh, it's uh, a total of about 140 um, actual clients. So the 330 loans include, you know, repeat borrowers. Mm, okay. And and your service area is from where to where? It's all throughout the state of California. All throughout the with state. With the majority of our clients um, coming from the Santa Cruz and Monterey County. Uh huh. Uh huh. Cool. Um, we do have a question it, here. Um, oh, good. What? Oh, I'm sorry to interject. Um, uh, what does Ms. Magana grow? Magana, Mrs. Magana grows a, a diverse mix of organic vegetables with, um, I primarily focus on strawberries. 
If anybody buys strawberries in California, chances are they come from Watsonville. Exactly. <laughs> and and I'm not sure how much I'm not sure how how much they export to the East Coast or across the country, but I'm guessing quite a bit. Um, well, I know I believe it or not, I was in I was in Toronto. Um, I want to say four years ago, and um, I happened to come across a strawberry basket that had uh, Watsonville on it. Yeah. So that was pretty exciting. Uh huh. Great. We'll take some other questions about more in depth on how you might partner with some of the other organizations and all that kind of stuff. But if there are there any other clarifying questions for Mario about him or FarmLink, or there the type of clients they work with. If not, then um, we'll move on over to uh, to Emmy from Latino Economic Development Center. So, Emmy Reyes, thank you for joining us. Please take it away. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, and I do want to clarify that we are the Latino Economic Development Center located in D.C. I know there's another one, I think, in Kentucky. I learned at the last NALCAP conference. Um, but, yes, I'd like to begin with, with talking a little bit about myself. Um, so, I'm a D.C. native. My family is um, from El Salvador, and I sort of grew up in a family of restaurateurs. My family operated about four to five restaurants growing up um, here in D.C. Uh, and I decided to go to college in Vermont where I established our school's farm. Um, and 10 years later, it's still operational and, and sort of self-sustaining. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and, and after that experience, I, I decided to work for Chipotle, uh, both in the New York region as well as in the D.C. area helping to open new stores and train new managers on operations. Um, and it was really my desire to help entrepreneurs outside of the corporate environment that led me to, to LEDC, uh, where I now help manage our lending department. Um, and it's a role that's allowed me to also participate on the Mayor's Food Policy Council, where I help advise on legislation that impacts um, food entrepreneurs here in the D.C. area. Um, but great, we can go ahead and get started to talk about LEDC. If we could go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so LEDC has been around since 1993, um, and we really work to, to fulfill our mission of driving economic and social advancement um, to low-income residents in the D.C. area by offering two main services. One is that we have a housing department that works with residents um, who are first-time home buyers, and we help them navigate the various sort of housing programs that are offered to them. We also help with affordable housing preservation. Uh, LEDC was recently instrumental in the creation of a tenant union to help um, organize tenants um, to improve their living conditions. And we also help work with uh, foreclosure prevention. Um, and then we have our small business program, which is where I will focus for this department, or for this presentation. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so our small business programs um, are, for, are really two main things. We offer free technical assistance, um, and we do that by having coaches on staff as well as subsidizing the cost of meeting with specialized consultants like lawyers and accountants or tax attorneys um, that our clients may need. And then we have our small business lending, where we could go to the next slide. And here, uh, I want to highlight uh, briefly sort of our, our lending and who we service. So um, LEDC does between 160 to 200 loans a year. Um, and we've had sort of that loan marker for the last 10 years or so. Um, about nine out of 10 of our clients are minority um, clients. Um, I will say that a third of our portfolio is currently related to food businesses. Um, so we're very proud of that, and that's something that's emblematic in all of our markets, not just in D.C., but also in Maryland, Virginia. And we can go to the next slide. So in terms of our lending, we offer our loan products from as little as $500, actually, and uh, our loans of $500 are designed to be credit builder loans. So we have clients who are interested in starting businesses, but they know that currently their credit score is too low. Um, to access capital down the road. And so we will sometimes start with a $500 loan with the sole purpose of improving their credit score and establishing that credit history so that they are prepared when they're ready to start their business. Uh, and then we provide small business loans from $1,000 to $250,000. Um, 
and we uh, I will say that um, all of our loan products are offered to all of our clients regardless of industry and we do offer these loan products of up to 250 to startups as well so unlike a bank that may sometimes restrict how much they lend to a startup or if they fund a startup at all um, we sort of have all of our offerings open to all of our clients next slide please Thank you. So in terms of our food offering specifically, um, we have sort of three main um, programs. The first is our Food Ventures program, um, which we just started last year. And here it's sort of, it's a free technical assistance with a focus on for food entrepreneurs. Um, and through the program, our clients get to work with professional chefs and restaurant managers, as well as restaurant consultants. And it's uh, uh, situated in, in such a form that it's a cohort, and it's a three-month-long program. Um, and people who participate in this program come out with their food manager certification, um, and we try to sort of have that, give them that exposure. We host events for them to showcase their, their food products um, and really make sure that they are understand of what the food system really is in the city before they really um, go ahead and start their business. Um, the next is our restaurant expansion loan. Um, so some um, of you may be aware that the Department of Health and Human Services has a program called Community Economic Development Projects. And what these are, uh, or what this is, is that the Department of Health and Human Services funds projects that um, improve or increase access to um, employment for low-income residents. So LEDC has been fortunate enough for the last four years in a row to be awarded this grant from the program, which allows us to supply up to $200,000 loans to food businesses that are growing or expanding at 0% interest. Um, and so through this program, we have been able to fund eight new restaurants in the city um, that have all been pretty successful so far. Um, and, and these are restaurants um, owners who are truly committed to improving the conditions for low-income residents so they have clear programs of growth development for their staff so that people can grow, you know, from an entry level server position to a more management position. Um, and lastly, we have this food truck loan um, where we recognize that in the city, a lot of our food truck clients were going to online lenders because of the expediency. Um, whenever their food truck broke down, they needed something, you know, quickly and weren't as concerned with interest rates. And then, of course, this creates a problem them on their cash flow down the line once those daily withdrawals begin. And so what we decided to work on was a loan product that where we provide the approval within two days of receiving the documentation and we try to disperse the funds on the third day. Um, and we allow them to pay interest only payments while the food truck is being repaired or established so that they can get back on the road and, and you know, getting that cash flow going um, back on the road. And then the last one. Um, and lastly, I'd like to showcase a couple of our success clients. Um, the first being Sweet Green. Some of you may be aware um, they started here in D.C. with one location. Um, LEDC was instrumental in them being able to open their second location. Um, and the rest is sort of history. They're now a national chain and they're based in California. Um, another one is uh, Bad Saint. They're a Filipino restaurant. Um, they received funding from us to open in 2015. Since then, they've been featured on the best restaurants in the country um, pretty consecutively all five years. Um, their head chef recently won um, a very prestigious award within the food industry, and they're also on the Michelin Guides for 2020. Um, and then lastly, something that's happening, I think, in many major cities across the country, but here in D.C. is um, the sort of creation of a lot of food halls. Um, food halls have presented a, a very interesting challenge for, for food entrepreneurs because it's very appealing and at the same time it's a very competitive and expensive process. Um, LEDC has been able to help a number of clients successfully open their locations there. Um, one of the first being Arepa Zone, which is a Venezuelan Arepa's business. They started with a food truck in Arlington, Virginia. LEDC provided their first loan to acquire a second food truck that operated exclusively in D.C. We then provided them with a second loan that allowed them to open their first location in Union Market, um, which is a food hall here in the city. And then lastly, a year ago, we were able to uh, offer them this sort of 0% interest loan that allowed them to open their fresh brick and mortar. Um, so when they started with the LADC, they had 12 employees and they're now up to 47. 
Um, so we're very happy for them. And, um, you know, the last client that we're showcasing is Peruvian Brothers, who also started with one food truck. Um, they now have three food trucks within the area, and they just opened um, their first sort of brick and mortar within the uh, La Cosecha Union Market, which is the newest, largest food truck here, or um, sorry, food hall here in D.C. Um, and they were the first business within that food hall to sort of finish their construction, um, and in part was due to our 0% interest loan. Um, and of course, now we're, we're trying to work with other business owners who are trying to go into that space to ensure that um, it's a fair entry for them as well. Uh, and yeah, I think that may be it. Amy, this is Heidi. I have a clarifying question on that zero interest loan. Who are you partnering with and like how is it structured? Yeah. Um, um, so the center, or sorry, the uh, Department of Housing and Human Source, or Services mm -hmm. um, has this community economic project. And so what it is is that CDFIs and I think, I believe some banks as well, apply for grant funding from this department um, for projects that will improve or uh, increase um, jobs for, for low-income residents. And so LEDC applies for that grant, um, and we then disperse those that grant money in the forms of loans to, to entrepreneurs in the city. So it's a HUD grant, is it like a federal, is it a federal grant or? or do yes, you, well, yes. Yeah, so it's a, oh wow. That's interesting, the, that's the, kind uh, of. Just to clarify, the, the CED grant is, is with the Department of, of Health and Human Services. Oh, the Health and Human Services. Right. Oh, wow, that's interesting. That's, um, that's a new resource. Um, um, the, a number of, um, of NALCAP members have been able to use the, this yeah. community economic development grant to, um, to establish revolving loan funds and incubators, uh, create subsidiaries, but a number of the projects have been related to food. Uh, is it, okay, so is it a community, a CDBG fund? Or something completely no. different. Yeah. Okay. So it's no, different. Okay. The, Great. Well, completely well, different. Yeah. We could uh, talk yeah. more in the sort of additional resources about it. Yeah. Oh, we did have another question come through. Um, what is the typical loan size for the food truck uh, loans? Yeah, they tend to be um, pretty small. It depends on what they need, right? A, a Repozone's food truck, for example, um, broke down, and what they realized that the uh, engine itself was one brand, and then the facade or the exterior of the food truck was a different brand. So while they initially expected, you know, the repairs to cost 10000 it ended up costing $25,000. Um, so our, I would say that we try to cover sort of the immediate expense of whatever repairs are, are necessary, and that tends to be between ten to 15000 But we obviously understand that sometimes um, these things may, may increase in value, and we try to sort of readily and quickly supply them with whatever additional funds they may need for it. Great, and thank what's you. Your, what, what's your turnaround time on, on like a sort of, short, a smaller loan like that? Yeah, so our food truck loans, we try to get it out within three to four days. <gasps> wow, that's fantastic. And another to, question to related even quicker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> another question related to that. Are there anything? Um, is there anything special in uh, your underwriting considerations or um, your um, how the terms are structured for either your restaurant or your food truck loans that differ from um, another type of small business loan? Yeah. So typically, you know, for um, startups there's going to be some months in which they cannot, um, you know, the time period between when we disperse the funds and when they open, um, we don't want to create issues where they have to instantly start paying us. So we are sometimes able to provide interest-only payments. Um, for the CD, we can't offer a grace period, but if we're using sort of regular LEDC funds and we provide a loan, we are able to provide, you know, two to three months grace period while they get their doors open before they have to start paying the loan back. Um, I will say that in D.C. specifically, um, uh, one in seven restaurants or, you know, about a third of our restaurants that open every year close down within the year. Um, so it is a very competitive 
um, uh, in risky industry to go into. Uh, most CDFIs in the area sometimes cap how many food businesses they will work with. Banks sort of outright refuse to, to fund food startups. Um, and so we, we strive to be very considerate of what the needs are um, and obviously do that in a responsible sort of manner. Great. Um, if there aren't uh, any clarifying questions for Emmy right now, so, you know, we'll say you know, thank you, Emmy, and we'll open up the, the Q&A session um, right now and uh, so we can pose questions to both Mario and Emmy. If you have a question, please uh, type it into the Q&A box on the right-hand corner of your, street, your screen. Um, we'd love to be able to uh, uh, field your questions and get those answered. Um, but I can start us off if um, perhaps uh, our guest speakers can talk about what role access to capital overall plays uh, in the very different communities that they serve. I guess, yeah, I can I guess I can start with, um, with that one. Um, the it, in, in in our case, um, you know, the capital access plays a huge role for um, our community because in some cases, um, it is the difference between continuing continuing their business or um, having to shut down their their operation. Uh, most of our borrowers are borrowers with repayment abilities um, that we've seen, um, but are sometimes turned down because of uh, from traditional lenders because uh, they don't have the uh, traditional eligibility requirements like credit history. Um, or collateral, um, among many other uh, factors. Very cool. Yeah, and would... Go on ahead, Em. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to sort of echo uh, what Mario said. I, I, I agree completely. And, and sometimes CDFIs really do make the difference between whether a business is able to open or not. Um, I also think that we're very important in sort of being a first step for many business owners, um, right? My goal is always to help our clients sort of graduate um, so that they are able to go to banks or, or access other types of, of capital further down the line. Um, and, and so we're really that first step that's necessary for them to be able to grow uh, once the business is ready to do so. That's a really good um, leeway, Emmy, into another question I had, if you could talk about, and then Mario, um, the trajectory of a typical client. So what they'll, they'll, you, you kind of have a couple of examples there, but they come to you first to do what, and then how do they grow, and then at what point would you turn them over to graduation? <laughs> yeah, so I would say that for us, um, you know, oftentimes you get clients who think that money will solve everything. And so first is an assessment to see if, uh, what are their true needs. And, and sometimes um, once a, a client really makes it over that half a million dollar mark in, in revenue, um, that's when we start to be even pickier with what we want to see in terms of accounting, um, whether they have QuickBooks or not. And so oftentimes we'll pair them up with a coach um, simultaneously as a loan officer, uh, and the two will sort of communicate and work together to ensure that once this money goes into the business, it is able to help them increase um, their, their revenue or adjust whatever issues that they're facing. Um, I will say that, you know, some clients, like a Reposone, for example, we've supplied them with four loans, right? And each of those has allowed them to physically expand. Um, but some others, it, like Bad Saint, for example, um, it's still the same size it was when it opened four years ago or four or five years ago. Um, it it's has this sort of exclusivity thing about it going on. Um, and so we think, you know, that's completely fine. Um, that saint has made it to the point where uh, they're just so so big and popular um, sort of in terms of how they know, uh, how well they're known, but physically they don't need to expand or, or, do, or don't want to right now. Um, but our goal is, is to really be that first step. And then um, oftentimes, like a, a Repazone um, recently came back to us and, and we decided that we were ready for them to, to go onto a bank. Um, and so uh, we connected them with a local um, credit union here in the city and, and now they're over with them. And so that for us was sort of a, a success story in terms of um, their access to capital. Mario, you want to take a stab? 
Uh, well, in, in, in our particular case, um, you know, due to the um, small scale farmers uh, that we work with, uh, you know, the majority of our loan portfolio consists of these uh, small scale farmers. So um, for them, uh, it is it, it is important for um, to you know, or it is important for us to try to get them to, uh, in this you know case, graduate um, and, and look for other lenders. But because, like I mentioned earlier, you know, due to the traditional um, eligibility requirements because of credit history or lack of um, credit history, or in, most importantly, the collateral, um, you know, sometimes that's uh, kind of a little bit difficult. Um, so in, in, in most cases, what I've seen is that they, they, they feel comfortable coming to places like um, CDFIs or, um, because they, they feel that they're valued uh, more uh, and treated more humane than uh, if they went to go uh, to a, a traditional um, lender. Great. That's very helpful. Um, maybe we can talk now, um, if there's another question out there, uh, if you could touch on what, what's really needed uh, for you to help make a client loan ready. How do you get them there? Well, in, in our um, situation, um, I believe it's uh, important to create a good system um, to ensure that we get that information that, or we get the information that we need from the, from the clients. Um, one thing I've noticed or I've seen uh, working with agriculture um, clients is that they're extremely knowledgeable when it comes to farming, um, but it is difficult to sometimes put that information in paper. Um, so I believe it is our job you know, to ask the right questions and create the right um, tools to facilitate um, getting all that information and putting that information in the format that we that we need in order to be able to underwrite a, a loan. Great. And Emmy, do you have um, anything to, to add there? I know um, other groups refer uh, possible clients to, to LEDC to, to seek out funding. What advice could you uh, give to them and what else do you guys do to help um, make a client loan ready? Yeah, I would say that we our coaching, our coaches work very closely with our clients um, prior to providing a loan to them. You know, there's a, in terms of sometimes it's not necessarily just getting a client loan ready, but sort of really ready to, to run their own business, right? There's a difference between a lawyer who has sort of a passion for baking and decides to open a bakery um, to someone who's operated or worked in a bakery all of their life and they've finally decided to venture out onto their own. Um, and, and those two different types of, of entrepreneurs need very different services um, and guidance, right? And so we really try to um, some way find our clients' mentors um, within their industries who are able to share their experience with them. Um, and, and we're very lucky because a lot of our clients become mentors further down the line, um, which, is, which is something that's really exciting for us. And I think that uh, we, we try really to connect our, our clients to consultants to get their books in order, right? We want to make sure that we're not just providing them with a loan, but also providing them with sort of educational financial literacy so that they really understand what they're getting into going down the road. Um, I think we may discuss sort of online lending a bit more later, but um, a lot of food entrepreneurs go to these online lenders out of, of, out of a desire for speed, um, and they get caught into these loans with APR between 100 to 260 percent sometimes, um, which is not illegal and, and <laughs> very oftentimes used here in the city. And so we want to make sure that they know to avoid those, right, and that there's always another option, whether it be LEDC or another CDFI in the area. Um, you know, when a, when a client's lead is larger than, than something we have, we, we work very closely with other CDFIs that offer larger funds um, to be able to get them that funding that they may need. Emmy, that, that um, I mean, we can, I, I'd like to bring up the, that's a good segue, and just to briefly mention, I don't, the, online lending is a topic we can probably talk a lot, like for an entire hour on itself, but um, since a lot of people on this call are not lenders and are working with um, um, businesses directly and all the literature that um, they portray, they're the, for sort of probably the the first contact of a business owner with a, with the 
what I would what I mentioned as the business ecosystem. And it's really important to be aware of this trend of online lending. It's growing. You saw um, Storm mentioned that um, people seeking online um, loans have grown um, from like 24% to 32%. Um, so it's by a full eight percentage basis point, but if you think the growth is actually 50%. So it's a lot of people are going um, uh, online to look for loans because, it, because it's easy. And um, so I just want to caution everybody to make sure that, they're, that that's part of the, your curriculum. Um, and we'll give you a resource at the end that you can um, talk to, to, you can get um, information at, and um, you can contact me or, or NALCAB any, at the NALCAB staff, and we can point you in the right direction to get more information. Because it's a, it, those APRs of 200 and of over, over triple digits. Um, really will destroy business, and um, I think you 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 do see some refinancing of that. Is that true, Emmy? Yes, and it's um, a little alarming how frequent that's become. But we have had to sort of refinance a lot of our, um, uh, I would say, several clients' um, online debt within the last couple of months. Um, I think the holiday period, or, or when typically for restaurants, the winter season tends to be a bit slower, and it's when they tend to go to those online lenders, not really fully understanding what that's going to do to their cash flow. Um, mm -hmm. We had a client recently where we consolidated $50,000. Um, however, they still had to pay what they would have paid in the accumulated interest um, because they were getting out of it five months early. And so those mm -hmm. are the types of little catch catches that, that sometimes clients don't see. Yeah. So we again, we can spend a whole whole hour on what are the problems, um, and just so everybody knows that not all online lenders are bad lenders. Um, there are some good players out there, and the key thing is transparency in in terms. And there are some efforts actually in California, and I know there's a bill up in New York. Um, see how these these all the different things play together: the policy, capital. Um, coaching, um, they're all intertwined. Uh, so let's let's uh, let's move on from the online lending conversation because we could spend quite a bit of time on that. I think. Um, what what uh, are there any questions in the chat box? Um, there's no questions. I have another there question. Are the, there aren't yeah. any uh, any current questions right now. So. Uh, to folks attending, please remember that you can enter your questions in the chat box on the right. And um, let's bring it back to our communities and um, what they may be experiencing as far as um, accessing capital. And what's um, what what do you see that's different in the Latino food entrepreneurship community that um, Either, either in trends or um, in their um, attitudes toward debt, or what should we be aware of um, when we're serving this community? Um, Mario? Yeah, I've also seen, you know, that, that trend of um, clients coming in with loans that they've received from, um, you know, fast lenders. Um, and that's something that I've seen uh, in the past where, you know, clients, because they're in a rush to get their funds, um, you know, they sometimes uh, opt to go to uh, these type of lenders that have promised to uh, give them loans, you know, either that same day or the following day and unfortunately are not familiar with the terms that uh, these loans come with. Uh, you know, in most cases, like Emmy mentioned, um, you know, some of those loans come with uh, prepayment penalties um, and, you know, they're, they're unaware of, of these um, hidden fees. Um, but for me, the, the biggest difference um, in the serving uh, the Latino community is more about the levels of experience in owning um, and or managing a business uh, for each Farmer that comes through our door. Um, we have farmers that, um, in some cases, have um, business education or tech savvy or are bilingual. Uh, and then we have farmers that are monolingual Spanish speakers, and all they know is farming and uh, have no uh, and need a little more assistance, uh, even though they're from the same community. Um, so understanding and having empathy, I think, is a key to helping uh, uh, you know these type of communities. Uh, but in general, I think it's important you know in any other type of community, not just the um, the Latino community. And is that a generational thing, or is it not a gener generational thing? Are the younger Latinos coming out with, like what you said, more bilingual, more tech-savvy? 
Um, no, because in, in some cases I've seen farmers that um, that do uh, that are a little older and uh, are tech savvy. Um, uh, what I've seen is that you know they get assistance from their um, their you know children um, or have somebody in the family that can that can assist them. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't really say um, you know it is, it's a gen um, generation type of thing. Got it. What about you, Emmy? You know, what comes to mind for me is, is sort of the legacy businesses um, that I that I see in the city, sort of Latino, you know, Mexican, Salvadoran restaurants that are now their children are, are starting to get involved and take over and considering whether renovating and expanding. We had a uh, business recently, it's called uh, Los Hermanos here in D.C., it's a Dominican food. The parents have owned and operated the business for 30 years now, uh, and they finally sort of decided to retire. And uh, now the, the two brothers have sort of taken over, and uh, we were able to supply them with a, a CED loan to expand, and now they're trying to build it into a uh, franchise model, and they've already opened two new locations. And sort of seeing the, the different needs that they had, right, their parents were um, – really risk adverse. They, they've known LEDC because we're on the same block for, for years now and, and never saw any funding from us. And then this younger generation came in and they reached out to us and now we've sort of helped them expand. And so um, it, it's really like a, a beautiful thing to see, you know, businesses stay within the family and, and that growth and expansion. And um, uh, I, I think I went on a tangent and didn't actually answer your question, but that, that is what sort of comes to mind to me right now. And um, I think it's CDFIs in general learning to adapt to, to the different needs that each generation of, of Latino business owners need. I actually think it, it perfectly answers the question because I, I know in some other communities or, or in the small business realm as a whole, um, you know, small we're, we're going to see a lot of people retire and baby boomers what do they do with their small businesses, whether they're food businesses or not, but this is a more general trend. And a lot, and a lot of the second generation, the next generation, don't want to go into business. So I think that actually is something. What you said is really kind of beautiful about the Latino community of, um, you know, wanting transgenerational, transgenerational, yeah, yeah. trans you know, and using this as a way for transgenerational wealth. That's really, that's different, exactly. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what about? Um, that's a good thing. What about a, something that's a, more of a barrier to capital in the Latino community? Yeah, I think it depends, right? So for recent immigrants, for example, we tend to do uh, our credit builder loans um, because they have no credit history. Um, and so uh, that's, that's one of our, the main obstacles I think that um, sort of recent immigrants to the country may have um, in general. Uh, there's obviously still some language barrier issues here. Um, but I think in, in D.C., in banks in general are, are starting to expand. Um, Chase and M&T and all these larger banks are now opening locations and branches throughout parts of the city that for a very long time have been ignored. Um, you know, Southeast D.C. for a long time had, I think, two banks serving um, 200,000 people uh, versus sort of more populated parts of the city where there's literally eight blocks you know, eight banks per block. Um, and so the availability of banking um, for the Latino community um, and other low-income residents is, is something that we definitely have to keep an eye on. We have a question from the audience here. Um, can you talk a bit more about serving um, and lending to ITIN holders and non-citizens? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So LEDC, uh, we uh, receive funding both from federal government, local government, but also private funds. Um, in the recent months, Wells Fargo and Chase have both stepped up their funding. Um, and it is this type of funding that we're able to use for ITIN holders. So all of our lending products are available to, to all ITIN holders as well as, um, you know, people with Social Security.
Okay, and, and I can just piggyback Mario? real quick off of what, yeah, I can just piggyback real quick off of what Emmy say. We are also uh, federally funded, um, you know, through uh, grants as well as private investors or impact investors, as well as um, donations. And um, we do also offer loans to um, I-10 holders. As a matter of fact, I believe that um, currently 23% of our borrowers in our loan portfolio consist of um, I-10 um, holders. And if so we can, um, <laughs> excellent. Um, if we can uh, also touch on quickly about what's you know unique in terms of uh, serving agricultural clients um, and uh, the rural community versus um, lending in urban areas. Sure. Um, the the primary difference, in in my opinion, my opinion is that. Um, that in uh, agricultural lending, uh, you have um, you know seasonality, seasonality crops. Uh, so in agriculture, most of the time there's no income coming in during uh, the winter time, uh, which is when farmers need capital to plant and get prepared for next season. In some cases, um, we also have unmanageable factors that play an important role in agriculture, like climate changes, um, issues with soil or water. Um, so you know having to take all that information into consideration when underwriting these loans. Um, I believe this you know one of the biggest challenge and difference between uh, traditional lending and, and ag lending. Great, thank you. And well, since we are almost at the hour, we're going to, to move on, but I'd really like to thank both uh, Emmy and Mario for joining us today and uh, sharing your insight and experiences on this, uh, this great topic. Um, Today was intended to give organizations into an insight into capital options and the environment for food businesses. So we wanted to conclude by sharing some additional resources for those who want to take a deeper dive into this topic. Uh, there's the Federal Small Business, uh, Federal Reserve Small Business Credit Surveys. There's also a link to NALCAP's Small Business Lending and Capacity Building uh, Technical Assistance application through SBA Prime. We have Cameo's Local Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Toolkit, the Small Business Borrower's Bill of Rights, uh, the Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems. They have a really uh, interesting uh, product there on uh, funding resources for food-related businesses, not just in Michigan, but across the country. It's a nice look at options available. Um, there's a link to the Latino Economic Development Corporation website and to the California Farm Link website. Next page, please. And then also, we wanted to remind you to connect with us via social media and through these channels. And next slide, remind you to sign up for the next webinar in this series, which will be two weeks from today, February 20th. Um, it will be ensuring a fertile regulatory environment for food businesses. So we hope to see you there. Um, again, the slides in this recording will be shared with all attendees. Uh, thank you to our speakers and to our co-hosts at Cameo. Um, we really appreciate um, your sharing your time and your expertise on this uh, very timely project. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.